I mentioned in the sermon that the letter from the eight white clergy called A Call for Unity uh, would be posted on our website. I thought it would be a good idea to record it as well in case people would want to hear it, hear it read. Just as a bit of background, it was in uh, March of 1963 that Martin Luther King Jr. joined with the local uh, black organizations in Birmingham, Alabama uh, to put some pressure on the local businesses to try and, try and desegregate and work towards desegregation. Birmingham, Alabama was one of the most staunchly uh, segregated cities in the United States at the time. And so they went down, they trained a bunch of people in, in nonviolent protesting, and they said, we're going to continue protesting until we can, can move towards desegregation. And it was in that context that uh, Martin Luther King Jr. on uh, Good Friday, which is April 12th, he was arrested for violating uh, a court order that had said no more protesting. And they said, we, we can do nothing but, but continue protesting because we've waited uh, too long already. And so he was put in prison, and he wasn't even allowed to have contact with his wife, who had just given birth to, I think it was their, um, their fourth child. And uh, he had a newspaper with him, and on his newspaper, when he, when he heard about this call for unity from these eight white clergy, um, he wrote his response, a letter from the Birmingham jail, on the, the uh, edges of his, uh, of his newspaper. And then that was written up. And it must have been a fairly long newspaper, because it's a long response. So I'm going to do two videos. I'm going to do one of the actual letter from the clergy, the call for unity, uh, and we'll hear what they were saying and then hear what uh, Martin Luther King Jr.'s response was to that. Alabama clergyman's letter to Martin Luther King Jr. and to those who are protesting. April 12, 1963. We, the undersigned clergymen, are among those who in January issued an appeal for law and order and common sense in dealing with racial problems in Alabama. We expressed understanding that honest convictions in racial matters must properly be pursued in the courts, but urged that decisions of those courts should be, in the meantime, peacefully obeyed. Since that time, there had been some evidence of increased forbearance and a willingness to face facts. Responsible citizens have undertaken to work on various problems which caused racial friction and unrest. In Birmingham, recent public events have given indication that we all have opportunity for a new, constructive, and realistic approach to racial problems. However, we are now confronted by a series of demonstrations by some of our Negro citizens, directed and led in part by outsiders. We recognize the natural impatience of people who feel that their hopes are slow in being realized, but we are convinced that these demonstrations are unwise and untimely. We agree rather with certain local Negro leadership, which has called for honest and open negotiations of racial issues in our area. And we believe this kind of facing of issues can best be accomplished by citizens of our own metropolitan area white and Negro, meeting with their knowledge and experience of the local situation. All of us need to face that responsibility and find proper channels for its accomplishment. Just as we formerly pointed out that hatred and violence have no sanction in our religious and political tradition, we also point out that such, such actions as incite to hatred and violence however technically peaceful those actions may be, have not contributed to the resolution of our local problems. We do not believe that these days of new hope are days when extreme measures are justified in Birmingham. We commend the community as a whole and the local news media and law enforcement officials in particular on the calm manner in which these demonstrations have been handled. We urge the public to continue to show restraint should the demonstrations continue and the law enforcement officials to remain calm and to continue to protect our city from violence. We further strongly urge our Negro community to withdraw support for these demonstrations and to unite locally in working peacefully for a better Birmingham. When rights are consistently denied, a cause should be pressed in the courts 
and in the negotiations among local leaders, and not in the streets. We appeal to both our white and Negro, Negro citizenry to observe the principles of law and order and common sense. Signed, C.C.J. Carpenter, Bishop of Alabama, Joseph A. Durek, Auxiliary Bishop, Diocese of Mobile, Alabama, Rabbi Hilton Grafton, Temple Emmanuel L. Birmingham, Bishop Paul Harden, Bishop of Alabama West Florida Conference of Methodist Churches, Bishop Holen B. Harmon, Bishop of North Alabama Conference of Methodist Churches, George M. Murray, Bishop Coadjunctor, Episcopal Diocese of Alabama, Edward V. Ramsage, Moderator, Synod of, of Alabama, and Minister of First Presbyterian Church in Birmingham, Alabama. Interestingly, of these signatories, I was able to find out more information on the Roman Catholic priest who signed this document. He was one who, following the response that he heard from Martin Luther King Jr., became an activist for black rights. He was considered a heretic in many ways within the Roman Catholic Church for his choosing to side with black activists. We commend him. Now I'd like to read the response that was written by Martin Luther King Jr. I'm going to read the entire response. It's quite long, but it's important to hear his own words when confronted by these white clergy and their perspective. May God give us wisdom to hear these words. Birmingham City Jail, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., April 16th, 1963. Dear fellow clergymen, while confined here in the Birmingham City Jail, I came across your recent statement calling our present activities unwise and untimely. Seldom, if ever, do I pause to answer criticism of my work and ideas. But since I feel that you are men of genuine goodwill and your criticisms are sincerely set forth, I would like to answer your statement in what I hope will be patient and reasonable terms. I think I should give the reason for my being in Birmingham, since you have been influenced by the argument of outsiders coming in. I have the honor of serving as president of the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, an organization operating in every southern state with headquarters in Atlanta, Georgia. We have some 85 affiliate organizations all across the South. Several months ago, our local affiliate here in Birmingham invited us to be on call to engage in a nonviolent direct action program if such were deemed necessary. We readily consented. And when the hour came, we lived up to our promise. So I am here along with several members of my staff because I have basic organizational ties here. Beyond this, I am in, the Bir in Birmingham because injustice is here. Just as the 8th century prophets left their little villages and carried their thus saith the Lord far beyond the boundaries of their hometowns. And just as the apostle Paul left his little village in Tarsus and carried the gospel of Jesus Christ to practically every hamlet and city of the Greco-Roman world, I too am compelled to carry the gospel of freedom beyond my particular hometown. Like Paul, I must constantly respond to the Macedonian call for aid. Moreover, I am cognizant of the interrelatedness of all communities and states. I cannot sit idly by in Atlanta and not be concerned about what happens in Birmingham. Injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. We are caught in an inescapable network of mutuality, tied in a single garment of destiny, Whatever affects one directly affects all indirectly. Never again can we afford to live with this narrow provincial outsider agitator idea. Anyone who lives inside the United States can never be considered an outsider anywhere in this country. In any nonviolent campaign, there are four basic steps. One, collection of facts to determine whether injustices are alive. Two, negotiation. Three, self-purification, and four, 
direct action. We have gone through all of these steps in Birmingham. Birmingham is probably the most thoroughly segregated city in the United States. Its ugly record of pol police brutality is known in every section of the country. Its unjust treatment of Negroes in the courts is a notorious reality. There have been more unsolved bombings in Negro homes and churches in Birmingham than in any city in this nation. These are the hard, brutal, and unbelievable facts. On the basis of these conditions, Negro leaders sought to negotiate with the city fathers, but the political leaders consistently refused to engage in good faith negotiations. Then came the opportunity last September to talk with some of the leaders of the economic community. In these negotiations, negotiating sessions, certain promises were made by the merchants, such as promises to remove the humiliating racial signs from the stores. On the basis of these promises, Reverend Shuttlesworth and the leaders of the Alabama Christian Movement for Human Rights agreed to call a moratorium on any type of demonstrations. As the weeks and months unfolded, we realized that we were the victims of broken promises. A few signs, briefly removed, returned, and others remained. As in so many experiences in the past, we were confronted with blasted hopes, and the dark shadow of a deep disappointment settled upon us. So we had no alternative except that of preparing for direct action, whereby we would present our very bodies as a means of laying down our case before the conscience of the local and national community. Mindful of the difficulties involved, we decided to undertake a process of self-purification. We began a series of workshops on non-violence, and we repeatedly asked ourselves, are you able to accept the blows without retaliating? Are you able to endure the ordeals of jail? We decided to schedule our direct action program for the Easter season, realizing that except for Christmas, this is the main shopping period of the year. Knowing that a strong economic uh, withdrawal program would be a byproduct of direct action, we felt this would be the best time to bring pressure to bear on merchants for the needed change. You may well ask, what direct action? Why sit-ins, marches, etc.? It's, it's an, isn't negotiation a better path? You are exactly right in your call for negotiation. Indeed, this is the purpose of direct action. Nonviolent direct action seeks to create such a crisis and establish such creative tension that a community that has con constantly refused to negotiate is forced to confront the issue. It seeks to so to dramatize the issue so that it can no longer be ignored. My citing of the creation of tension as part of the work of the nonviolent resistance may sound rather shocking, but I must confess that I am not afraid of the word tension. I have earnestly opposed nonviolent tensions, but there is a type of constructive nonviolent tension which is necessary for growth. The purpose of our direct action program is to create a situation so crisis packed that it will inevitably open the door to negotiation. My friends, I must say that you have not made a single gain in civil rights without legal and nonviolent pressure. History is the long and tragic story of the fact that privileged groups seldom give up their privileges voluntarily. Individuals may see the moral light and give up their unjust posture, but as Reinhold Niebuhr has reminded us, groups are more immoral than individuals. We know through painful experience that freedom is never voluntarily given by the oppressor. It must be demanded by the oppressed. Frankly, I have yet to engage in a direct action movement that was well-timed, according to the timetable of those who have not suffered unduly from the disease of segregation. For years now, I have heard the word, wait, it rings in the ear of every Negro with a pierced familiarity. This wait has almost always meant never. 
It has been a tranquilizing, thalidomide, relieving the emotional stress for a moment only to give birth to an ill-formed infant of frustration. We must come to see with the distinguished jurist of yesterday that justice too long delayed is justice denied. We've waited for more than 340 years for our constitutional and God-given rights. The nations of Asia and Africa are moving with jet-like speed toward the goal of political independence. And we still creep at horse and buggy pace toward a gaining of a cup of coffee at a lunch counter. I guess it is easy for those who have never felt the stinging dart of segregation to say, wait. But when you have seen vicious mobs lynch your mothers and fathers, at will and drown your sisters and brothers at whim, when you have seen hate-filled policemen curse, kick, brutalize, and even kill your black brothers and sisters with impunity, when you see the vast majority of your 20 million Negro brothers smothering in an airtight cage of poverty in the midst of an affluent society, when you suddenly find your tongue twisted, you are tongue twisted and your speech stammering, as he seeks to explain to your six-year-old daughter why she can't go to the public amusement park that has just been advertised on the television and see tears welling up in her little eyes when she is told that Funtown is closed to colored children and see the depressing cloud of inferiority begin to form in her little mental sky and see her begin to distort her little personality by unconsciously developing a bitterness towards white people when you have to concoct an answer for your five-year-old son who is asking in agonizing pathos, Daddy, why do white people treat colored people so mean? When you take a cross-country drive and find it necessary to sleep night after night in your uncomfortable corners of your automobile, because no motel will accept you, when you're humiliated day in and day out by nagging signs reading white men and colored, when you first, your first name becomes the N-word. I'm sorry, I can't say it. Your middle name becomes boy, however old you are. And your last name becomes John. And when your wife and your mother have never given, given the respect, they're never given the respectful title of Mrs. And when you're harried by day and haunted by night by the fact that you are a Negro living constantly at tiptoe stance, never quite knowing what to expect next and plagued with the inner fears and outer resentments when you are forever fighting the denigrating sense of nobodiness, then you will understand why we find it difficult to wait. There comes a time when the cup of endurance runs over. Men are no longer willing to be plunged into an abyss of injustice. There they experience the bleakness of corroding despair. I hope, sirs, you can understand our legitimate and unavoidable impatience. You express a great deal of anxiety over our willingness to break laws. This is certainly a legitimate concern, since we so diligently urge people to obey the Supreme Court's decision of 1954 outlawing segregation in public schools. It is rather strange and paradoxical to find us consciously breaking laws. One may well ask, how can you advocate breaking some laws and obeying others? The answer is found in the fact that there are two types of laws. There are just and there are unjust laws. I would agree with St. Augustine that an unjust law is no law at all. Now, what's the difference between the two? How does one determine when a law is just or unjust? A just law is a man-made code that squares with the moral law of the law of God. An unjust law is a code that is out of harmony with the moral law. To put it in terms of St. Thomas of Aquinas, an unjust law is a human law that is not rooted in the eternal and natural law. Any law that uplifts human personality is just. Any law that degrades human personality is unjust. 
all segregation statutes are unjust because segregation distorts the soul and damages the personality. It gives the segregator a false sense of superiority and the segregated a false sense of inferiority. To use the words of Martin Buber, the Jewish philosopher, segregation substitutes the I-it relationship for an I-thou relationship and ends up relegating persons to the status of things. So segregation is not only politically, economically, and sociologically unsound, but it is morally wrong and sinful. Paul Tillich has said that sin is separation. Isn't segregation an existential expression of man's tragic separation, an expression of awful estrangement, his terrible sinfulness? So I can urge men to disobey segregation ordinances because they are morally wrong. Let us turn to a more concrete example of just and unjust laws. An unjust law is a code that a majority inflicts on a minority that is not binding on itself. This is a difference made legal. On the other hand, a just law is a code that a majority compels a minority to follow that is willing, that is willing to follow itself. This is sameness made legal. Let me give another explanation. An unjust law is a code inflicted upon a minority which that minority had no part in enacting or creating because they did not uh, have the unhampered right to vote. Who can say that the legislature of Alabama, which set up the segregation laws, was democratically elected? Throughout the state of Alabama, all types of conniving methods are used to prevent Negroes from becoming registered voters. And there are some counties without a single Negro registered to vote, despite the fact that the Negro constitutes a majority of the population. Can any law set up in such a state be considered democratically structured? These are just a few examples of unjust and just laws. There are some instances when a law is just on the face and unjust in its application. For instance, I was arrested Friday on a charge of parading without a permit. Now, there is nothing wrong with an ordinance which requires a permit for a parade. But when the ordinance is used to preserve the segregation and to deny the citizens their First Amendment privilege of peaceful assembly and peaceful protest, then it becomes unjust. I hope you can see the distinction I'm trying to point out. In no sense do I advocate evading or defying the law as the rabid segregationists would do. This would lead to anarchy. One who breaks an unjust law must do it openly, lovingly, not hatefully, as the white mothers did in New Orleans when they were seen on television screaming, N-word, N-word, N-word. And with a willingness to accept the penalty, I submit that an individual who breaks a law that conscience tells him is unjust and willingly accepts the penalty by staying in jail to arouse the conscience of the community over its injustice is in reality expressing the very highest respect for law. Of course, there is nothing new about this kind of civil disobedience. It has been sublimely seen in the refusal of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego to obey the laws of Nebuchadnezzar because a higher moral law was involved. It was practiced superbly by the early Christians who were willing to face hungry lions and the excruciating pain of chopping blocks before submitting to certain unjust laws of the Roman Empire. To a degree, academic freedom is a reality today because Socrates practiced civil disobedience. I must make two honest confessions to you, my Christian and Jewish brothers. First, I must confess that over the last few years, I have been gravely disappointed with the white moderate. I have almost reached the regrettable conclusion that the Negro's great stumbling block in the stride toward freedom is not the white citizen's counselor or the Ku Klux Klan, but the white moderate 
who is more devoted to order than to justice, who prefers a negative peace, which is the absence of tension, to a positive peace, which is the presence of justice, who constantly say, I agree with you in the goal that you seek, but I can't agree with you in your methods or direct, of direct action, who paternalistically feels that he can set the timetable for another man's freedom, who lives by the myth of time, and who constantly advises Negro to wait until a more convenient season. Shallow understanding from people of goodwill is more frustrating than absolute misunderstanding from people of ill will. Lukewarm acceptance is much more bewildering than outright rejection. You spoke of our activity in Birmingham as extreme. At first, I was rather disappointed that fellow clergymen would see my nonviolent effort as those of an extremist. I started thinking about the fact that I stand in the middle of two opposing forces in the Negro community. One is a force of complacency made up of Negroes who, as a result of long years of oppression, have been so completely drained of self-respect and a sense of somebodyness that they have adjusted to segregation. And a few Negroes in the middle class who, because of a degree of academic and economic security, and at points they profit from segregation, have unconsciously become insensitive to the problems of the masses. The other force is one of bitterness and hatred and comes perilously close to advocating violence. It is expressed in the various black nationalist groups that are springing up over the nation, the largest of which is known as being Elijah Muhammad's Muslim movement. This movement is nourished by the contemporary frustration over the continuing existence of racial discrimination. It is made up of people who have lost faith in America, who have absolutely repudiated Christianity, and who have concluded that the white man is an incurable devil. Oppressed people cannot remain oppressed forever. The urge for freedom will eventually come. This is what happens to the American Negro. Something within has reminded him of his birthright of freedom. Something without has reminded him that he, has, that he can gain it. Consciously and unconsciously, he has been swept in by what the Germans call the zeitgeist and with the black brothers of Africa and his brown and yellow brothers of Asia and South America and the Caribbean, he is moving with a sense of cosmic urgency toward the promised land of racial justice. Recognizing this vital urge that has engulfed the Negro community, one should readily understand public demonstrations. The Negro has many pent-up resentments and latent frustrations. He has to get them out. So let him march sometimes, let him have his prayer vigils, pil prayer pilgrimages to the city hall. Understand why he must have sit-ins and freedom rides. If his repressed emotions do not come out in these non-violent ways, they will come out in ominous expressions of violence. This is not a threat. This is a fact of history. So I have not said to my people, get rid of your discontent but I have tried to say that this normal and healthy discontent can be channeled through the creative outlet of nonviolent direct action. In spite of my shattered dreams of the past, I came to Birmingham with the hope that the white religious leaders in the community would see the justice of our cause and with deep moral concern serve as the channel through which our just grievances could get, a better get, get to the power structure. I had hoped that each of you would understand, but again, I have been disappointed. I have heard numerous religious leaders of the South call upon their worshippers to comply with desegregation decisions because it is the law. But I have longed to hear white ministers say, follow these decrees because integration is morally right and the Negro is your brother. 
In the midst of blatant injustices inflicted upon the Negro, I have watched white churches stand on the sideline and merely mouth pious irrelevancies and sanctimonious trivialities in the midst of a mighty struggle to rid our nation of racial and economic injustice. I have heard so many ministers say, those are social issues with which the gospel has no real concern. And I have watched so many churches commit themselves to a completely otherworldly religion which made a strange distinction between body and soul, between sacred and secular. So here we are, moving to the exit of the 20th century with a religious community largely adjusted to the status quo, standing as a taillight behind other community agencies rather than a headlight leading men to higher levels of justice. I've traveled the length and breadth of Alabama, Mississippi, and all the other southern states. On sweltering summer days and crisp autumn mornings, I have looked at our beautiful churches with their lofty spires pointing heavenward. I have beheld the impressive outlay of their massive religious education buildings. Over and over again, I have found myself asking, what kind of people worship here? Who is their God? Where are their voices? When the lips of Governor Barnett dripped with words of interposition and nullification. Where were they when Governor Wallace gave the clarion call for defiance and hatred? Where were their voices of support when tired, bruised, and weary Negro men and women decided to rise from the dark dungeons of complacency to the bright hills of creative protest? Yes, these questions are still in my mind. In deep disappointment, I have wept over the laxity of the church. But be assured, my tears have been tears of love. There can be no deep disappointment where there is not deep love. Yes, I love the church. I love her sacred walls. How could I do otherwise? I am in the rather unique position of being the son and grandson and the great-grandson of preachers. Yes, I see the church as the body of Christ. But oh, how we have blemished and scarred that body through social neglect and fear of being nonconformists. There was a time when the church was very powerful. It was during the period when the early Christians rejoiced when they were deemed worthy to suffer for what they believed. In those days, the church was not merely a thermometer that recorded the ideas and principles of popular opinion. It was a thermostat that transformed the mores of society. Whenever the early Christians entered a town, the power structure got disturbed and immediately sought to convict them for being disturbers of the peace and outside agitators. But they went on with the conviction that they were a colony of heaven and had to obey God rather than man. They were small in number but big in commitment. They were too God-intoxicated to be astronomically intimidated. They brought an end to such ancient evils as infanticide and gladiatorial contest. I hope this letter finds you strong in the faith. I also hope that circumstances will soon make it possible for me to meet each of you, not as an integrationist or a civil rights leader, but as a fellow clergyman and as a Christian brother. Let us all hope that the dark clouds of racial prejudice will soon pass away and the deep fog of misunderstanding will be lifted from the fear-drenched communities and in some not too distant tomorrow, the radiant stars of love and brotherhood will shine over our great nation with all of their scintillating beauty. Yours for the cause of peace and brotherhood, M. L. King, Jr. May God add wisdom to these words, and may we be moved. Amen.